Let me tell you a little story about me when I was younger. When I was in school, there was this old man named Abu who ran the canteen. I used to love going to Abu's canteen. My heart was always set on his chicken biryani. And although it was super oily and definitely unhealthy, these are the kinds of things worth dying for. In order to fund my budding obesity, my mom used to give me 50 rupees once a week for lunch on Friday. And I could buy anything I wanted with it. For me, the money had a singular purpose. I was going to spend it all on Abu's biryani. It so happened that one week, I realized that instead of going and having a biryani that day, I wanted to save up for a later stage. My grand plan was to go three weeks without buying any of my dear chicken biryani and instead go and play football. Once I had collected enough money, I'd spend the whole week eating like royalty. So that is what I did. Sure, I'd be starving by the end of the day, but my dream of biryani week was just too exciting to resist. When the week finally arrived, I walked to school with a bounce in my step and a huge smile on my face. I spent every period just praying for the lunch break to ring on time and when it finally did ring at 12.05, I was the first person out of the classroom. I reached Abu's canteen and began to climb up the stairway to heaven. But out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a new laminated sign, one that nearly wiped the smile off my face. Due to rising costs, Abu had decided that one plate of biryani now costed Rs 60 and my plan for a majestic week of hogging was now shattered. You see, up to that point, I had only saved Rs 200. This would be enough for me to buy lunch on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. But when Thursday arrived, I knew that I would only find Rs 20 in my pocket. Instead of starving myself every week for a whole month, I would have been better off buying the biryani the second I got some cash. This was my first experience of a phenomenon known as inflation. So what is inflation? Inflation is the general increase in the average price of a basket of items. It basically means that a given amount of money can no longer buy the same amount of goods as it could in the past. This makes sense, doesn't it? We have been witnessing inflation all around us. So when does it make sense to put off consumption? Looking back on that biryani episode, I realized something. What I did during my school days is a lot like what a lot of people in India do their whole lives. When we get some money, we go straight to the bank and get an FD in our name. Or we buy property in a busy metropolitan area. Or we go and buy gold. People all over the world are in love with assets that can be seen or felt. Since that is the case, then what can be more attractive than a shiny gold block or the security of a newly bought home? The problem is that investing in gold or real estate is almost like me saving my 50 rupees every week. These investments cannot keep up with inflation. What this means is that even if the value of my investment in property does go up, my purchasing power will decrease. Based on an August 2017 survey conducted by the Reserve Bank of India, the average household holds 84% of its wealth in real estate and other physical goods. 11% is in gold and the remaining 5% is in financial assets. Households in developed economies hold a significantly larger portion of their savings in financial assets and are much more likely to finance a home through a loan. The stage is set for a whole generation of Indians who began working all the way back in the 1980s to struggle through their retirements. So how did the situation get so bad? We will now talk about the four myths that could have hampered your financial freedom and why you should desperately avoid them. First one is gold will protect my wealth. As mentioned earlier, the RBI report revealed that gold accounts for 11% of the wealth of an Indian household. For something to be worth 11% of your net worth, you really must have some hope that it would add value to your life, right? Well, not really. A 1 lakh investment in the BSE Sensex Index would have yielded a 4.5 times greater return than a similar 1 lakh investment in gold over the same 30-year period. Real estate will help me get richer. Real estate is by far the largest asset in the Indian portfolio. However, the problem is that real estate in India's metros have only seen returns of 3-4% to per annum. As it stands, Residential property in India, as a share of GDP, is the most expensive in the world. Property prices in our country are between 6 to 10 times more expensive than other Asian economies. Secondly, the rental yield is just 2 to 3 percent after considering taxes and brokerage costs. To take out a simple home loan, however, a person needs to pay 7 percent interest. The cost of financing your loan is higher than the rental yield. You are actually losing money on your loan. 
Thirdly, and most importantly, there can be tremendous risk in investing in real estate projects where the developer runs out of money. Hundreds of thousands of people have spent years in litigation when a developer ran out of funds and decided to flee the country. And finally, real estate is such an illiquid asset, which means that it cannot be sold immediately if you are in need of funds. And there are very high transaction costs, such as brokerage, stamp duty, etc. Trying to be successful in such an industry is a fool's errand, unless you're a broker. Myth number three, debt mutual funds offer decent returns with low volatility. When banks lend out money, they do so by charging some interest. This interest has four main components a risk-free rate of return, an inflation premium calculated by the bank, a liquidity premium, and finally, there's a chance that the borrower can default on his loan. Banks assess whether a borrower has a credit-worthy track record before they give you a loan. If you have a good credit score, then the bank gives you a loan at a lower interest rate. But if you have a poor credit score, then the banks will give you a higher interest rate for your loan. The debt market works in the same way. Essentially, debt mutual funds lend out money to businesses who want to raise capital through a bond issuance. Good companies can afford to raise funds at much lower rates than what debt mutual funds offer. Which means that in order to get market beating return on a debt mutual fund, the fund will have to either invest in illiquid companies or low rated companies. Very often, it is the case that the fund does both. When periods of market stress show up, and trust me, they will, there will be immense pressure to sell. Several debt mutual funds have actually gone under because the companies they invested in were of poor, substandard quality. Myth number four, trying to time the market. Most investors in India have the belief that if they time the economic cycle, they can time the stock market and hence make money. But the issue with this logic is that it takes time for reforms and investment of the government to start reflecting a change in the market. In fact, a booming stock market is actually a leading indicator for the economy. Take a look at this graphic. The S&P 500 is a collection of the top 500 largest companies in the US. Over the past 30 years, it has returned around 7.7% annually to investors. However, if you remove the best day of each year, the returns drop significantly. Things get even worse if you remove the two best performing days of the year. Investors will begin to see a loss in welfare if they miss out on greater than three days in the investing year. While trying to time the market, we are effectively putting ourselves in a casino where all the games are rigged to make us lose in search of short-term change. Conclusion This week's cup of coffee really does build up on a few of our earlier videos. The human mind is plagued by several biases and inconsistencies that make us very poor investors. If there is one thing that has amazed me in my few years as an investor so far, it is how easily it can be to fall into the trap of trading or trying to time the market, even though I should know better. It is always important for us to build a network of like-minded people and relearn things as often as possible. Keeping that in mind, I hope that you enjoyed this week's cup of coffee. I know that it's been a while since I last uploaded a video, but I am back now and I'm here to stay. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe if you like the content that you see here. I would also love to start talking about other subjects that not only excite me but also interest my viewers. If there are any specific topics out there that you would like to see in the future, please do let me know. As always, we are open to any tips and suggestions that you might have in mind. Keep smiling and until we meet again, this is Filter Coffee Finance signing off.